Good afternoon, everybody. What's that? Uh, Bob, I always have important information to share with you. Today will be no different. Uh, I did want to begin with a couple of operational updates uh, in the counter ISIL campaign before I uh, turn to your questions. Uh, first, in Syria, uh, Syrian opposition forces supported by coalition air power and the Turkish military are now in control of Jarablus on the Turkey Syria border. While ISIL has largely been forced out of the city, operations to clear pockets of resistance and IEDs left by ISIL continue. We did conduct additional coalition airstrikes today in support of the effort. Combined with the success of the Syrian Democratic Forces in freeing Manbij from ISIL, this is another important milestone in the military campaign. Again, this area of Jarablus has been a focal point of foreign fighter flow for ISIL. ISIL's ability to move those foreign fighters and potential external operatives back and forth across the border has put uh, the people of Syria, Iraq, Turkey, uh, and beyond at risk, and the Manbij to Jarablus route is no longer available to ISIL forces. Likewise, the route from Manbij to Raqqa has also been severed as a result of all these recent operations. This is a major blow to ISIL, and the Jarablus operation in particular, another significant step forward for the campaign. As has been reported, some of the SDF forces who fought so hard and so well to free Manbij have, as anticipated, moved back to the eastern side of the Euphrates River. Some SDF elements remain to secure Manbij against potential reinfiltration by ISIL forces and to conduct the difficult, dangerous task of removing IEDs from the city. The movement, this movement has long been part of our plan to focus available partnered forces on the next major objective, Raqqa, the so-called capital of the self-described ISIL caliphate. It's important to remember what the SDF has accomplished. Over the last two years, the SDF has liberated approximately 28,000 square kilometers of Syrian territory from ISIL's grip. Manbij was a costly fight for the SDF, but a deeply important one for the SDF and the counter-ISIL coalition. This operation demonstrates the importance and the viability of a strategy built on working with and through capable, motivated local forces as the best way to deal ISIL a lasting defeat. Shifting to the situation in Iraq right now, Iraqi security forces have made gains in their efforts to retake the city of Kiara, south of Mosul. Uh, just as Manbij and Jarablus are steps on the road to Raqqa, Kiara is an important objective on the way to the eventual liberation of Mosul in Iraq. As you know, Kurdish Peshmerga forces are also involved in the effort to envelop Mosul. They also have made key advances in recent days. In Libya, Switching there quickly, forces supporting the government of National Accord continue to take the fight to ISIL with the help of U.S. air power, and they continue to make progress in liberating the city from ISIL's control. As you know, Prime Minister Siraj met with our AFRICOM commander, General Waldhauser. The meeting provided, that happened yesterday, and the meeting provided General Waldhauser an opportunity both to provide the Prime Minister an update on U.S. support for the counter-ISIL fight in Libya, also a chance to discuss a common path forward for Libyan stability and security, and we look forward to continuing those discussions with the Prime Minister and the Government of National Accord. We remain clear-eyed in our understanding that there is still much work to do in defeating ISIL. The job will not be done quickly, easily, or without cost, but there is no question that on every front today, ISIL is under increasing pressure from a global coalition dedicated to its defeat. The United States will continue to work alongside a range of partners and allies in the fight to defeat ISIL in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and wherever else it may be found. Now, briefly, I know uh, you did hear earlier from General Cleveland, but I wanted to uh, address the, uh, the terror attack yesterday in Kabul. Uh, I just wanted to add that the United States, of course, strongly condemns this attack, uh, in which terrorists targeted a university dedicated to helping Afghans prepare themselves and their nation for a brighter future. On behalf of the Secretary and everyone in the Department of Defense, I offer our condolences to the families of the victims killed in this attack, as well as the wounded. Also, I'd like to thank the Afghan security forces, including American University security, Afghan police and military units who responded decisively to this incident, prevented an even greater tragedy, and they saved lives as a result of their actions yesterday. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Bob. You, having mentioned that the uh the SDF forces have moved back to the eastern side of the Euphrates. Are, are Turkish ground forces then, um, are they leaving or are they still flowing into the country? And also, could you give a little more detail about today's U.S. airstrikes in support of that operation in Jarablus? Um, I'll leave, the, leave it to the Turks to describe their next uh, military moves, but... Uh, I meant uh, current, the, currently. Currently, there's still Turkish forces in, in uh, at least in the area of Jarablus, uh, but again, in terms of their 
operations, what they'll do next, I'll leave that to the, to the Turks to describe. But again, that was part of the, uh, <clears throat> their movement that, were, that was coordinated with the coalition. And, and of course, we supported it with airstrikes yesterday. And there were, as I understand, uh, at least uh, one additional airstrike today. Uh, could, you, could you say, you having kind of spun out the scenario <coughs> there of having ha reached objectives in Manbij and uh, mm -hmm. Jarablus, uh, you mentioned Raqqa. Should we then see the operation against Raqqa as being imminent? How? Um, Bob, you know we're not going to put a, a calendar on it. Uh, we are working closely with uh, local forces, uh, both in, uh, in Syria and also, of course, with the government of Iraq and the Iraqi security forces uh, in Iraq. And we are moving at, at their timetable. Uh, but obviously this is something we want to accelerate. The Secretary has made clear he'd like to do this as quickly as possible. And as you can see, in Syria and Iraq, we have gained momentum in recent days, and we'd like to build on that momentum. I'm not going to put a timeline on it, but you know our ultimate objective here is Raqqa. Uh, the Secretary has wanted to, has made clear that the, that, as their so-called capital, their so-called caliphate, is a key objective here. Uh, and uh, and will be a difficult objective, and we'd like to make a, a move on that as quickly as possible. But we're going to move at the at the appropriate pace and coordination with those local forces that we're working with, and likewise the same for Mosul with the Iraqi security forces. But by all means, we'd like to do this as soon as possible. Thanks, yeah. Barbara. Peter on Iran and in the Gulf, the encounters with the U.S. Navy. Can you bring us up to date across the board? Um, what yesterday happened that led the Navy crew to believe they had to fire warning shots at this Iranian vessel? What can you tell us about the possibility that there were two other additional unsafe incidents yesterday? Not the video that we've all seen from two days ago, but I'm referencing the warning shots, two other incidents yesterday. And what's the assessment on what you think the Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy is up to, what this says about central command and control by the Iranians over their own security forces? Well, let me, there are a lot of questions in sure. there. So right. let, me, the let me, I'm sure I'm going to forget one, and you can remind me. Uh, th with regard to the event uh, yesterday um, that you all have reported on, um, again, the crew determined that uh, that these Iranian craft coming at them were approaching in an unsafe and unprofessional manner, and they did what our very professional Navy has been forced to do in the past when confronted with similar situations, and that is to take appropriate steps to try and de-escalate the situation. That's what they did in, in this instance. Um, they deemed these, air, these craft approaching them as unsafe and unprofessional, and they responded accordingly. And uh, that ended this particular situation yesterday, and again, our, our ships were in international waters, our sailors were conducting themselves professionally as they uh, are trained to do, and uh, we did not see the same from the Iranian boats on the other side. But is it not the case in the view of the U.S. military, if you are compelled, if you're in a situation where you are compelled to go to the step of having to fire warning shots, what does that say about the potential threat being posed to U.S. naval forces at that moment? Well, again, there's a series of steps that our crews um, are prepared to take to handle these situations. They are well-trained, Barbara, as you know. Uh, and the fact that they did have to reach that step, and uh, you're referring specifically to the incident involving the NHTSA here? No, I'm referring to yesterday. Okay. The NHTSA being, I'm, I'm sorry, I, just to clarify, I'm not talking about the NHTSA from two days ago. I'm talking about the um, USS Tempest and USS Squall in the Northern okay. Gulf yesterday. Okay. So this, um, first of all, for uh, I'm just seeing some of the information regarding this incident as well. So I don't have all the details. And I'm going to refer you for for as many details that I miss to CENTCOM and to NAVCENT because they'll have more than I will. Um, but my understanding is they were. Uh, in this instance, uh, they did feel compelled ultimately to fire three warning shots. And uh, the reason for that is they had used uh, steps, they had taken steps already to try and de escalate this situation, appropriate steps, including uh, uh, flares, uh, trying to again warn the Iranian craft away. And so they felt the need to 
take an additional step to try and de-escalate the situation, and that was, again, to fire these warning shots. And, uh, Barbara, these steps are taken in order to make sure that our crew and our uh, ship uh, they're able to protect themselves and to try and uh, and prevent this from escalating into a more serious situation. They did that. The Iranian uh, craft, as I understand it, left at that point. Um, but again, the onus here is on the Iranians to conduct themselves in a safe and professional manner, like navies all over the world do. And in this instance, in the instance the other day with the Nitsi, in the view of the crew, that did not happen. So it gets to. Um do, what do you? What does the U.S. think the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps naval forces are up to here? Are they are they under the control of the central government? Are they out there operating on their own? Are they threatening you? Do you feel a threat from them? Why are they doing all this? And can you see if you can clarify for us? Were there two additional incidents yesterday, unsafe incidents? But what do you think the IRGC is up to? So on. My understanding is that there may have been uh, yesterday uh, two in incidents involving the Tempest and the Squall, um, and uh, there was another incident involving another U.S. Navy ship. I quite honestly, I think it was uh, referenced um, the Stout, uh, and may have involved some of the same Iranian vessels. So you're talking about uh, maybe talking about some of the same craft, but separate separate incidents. So bigger picture here. Um, these were incidents that, the, again, the crews deemed that were unsafe and unprofessional. And as to why the Iranians are doing this, um, I'm going to leave it. You need to ask the Iranians what, uh, why they're doing this. They're not conducting themselves in the way that professional navies do. And we have these interactions all the time. We have interactions with the Iranians uh, all the time. And the Iranian, uh, and for a significant uh, number of times, these are uh, routine and safe and professional. At least that's been the that's been. Uh, but all these uh, others are IRGC. Uh, I, I'm going to leave it to Navsen and Sancom to to explain that to you in more detail. But uh, the big picture here, Barbara, is that these are incidents that carry a risk of escalation, and we certainly uh, don't desire any escalation, any sort of confrontation there. Our ships are operating as they have for years in that part of the world, in international waters, and will continue to do so. And uh, there is no need for this kind of, uh, if you will, unprofessional behavior. Uh, it does not serve any purpose. We're going to continue to operate, and we're going to continue to take the steps that we need to do to make sure that our sailors uh, and our ships are as safe as possible as they conduct their operations. Were warning shots only fired once yesterday, or this you, had, you said you had another, it, I guess the Iranians twice, is what you're saying, came unsafely close to the Tempest and the Squall, and at another point they came close to the Stout? The, the warning shots were only fired in this one instance, as I understand it. So. I guess I would just also say, I, I guess I, I do want to just say, I, if you could communicate to the Navy, I think the level of interest when the U.S. Navy fires warning shots at the Iranians is um, a, an immediate level of interest by the U.S. press corps. I think we, it's a little distressing to find this out as a point of history the next day rather than of news. Anything you could do to encourage the U.S. military to let note, tell us when they fire on another country? I, I believe they fired warning shots in the water. Uh, and, but, uh, Barbara, we're sharing this information. Uh, in some instances, like today, you might be reporting on it before some people in this building are totally aware, given the distances uh, and some of the information conveyed here. There's a chain of command that needs to be followed here. Uh, our right, sailors, our, our sailors are, are are conducting themselves professionally. They do have responsibilities to a chain of command. They have operations they need to maintain. And uh, again, our our folks were doing what they were supposed to be doing, and they've conducted themselves professionally. And there is a review, of course, as always in these situations, as to the circumstances involved here and how this played out. And that is still underway, as I understand. I appreciate it. I think you can understand. We want to know. Peter. Yeah. Paul? Um, I want to ask two separate questions. One is on the North Korean missile test. Uh, North Korea said this morning that it was a multi-stage missile that traveled on a high trajectory and successfully tested the warhead impact. At which, if true, seems like an advancement on their past missile tests. So, can you would you assess this as progress? And if so, does that worry you about uh, the situation on the peninsula? 
Uh, I'm not going to characterize uh, uh, their test other than to say, uh, as with previous tests by uh, the North Koreans, uh, this is uh, not only a violation of uh, UN resolutions, but is, uh, again, a, a provocative act by the North Koreans that does nothing to uh, promote stability and ease tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And, uh, and again, it demonstrates why we are uh, continuing to work so closely with our South Korean and uh, Japanese allies uh, in terms of uh, the steps we need to take to make sure that, uh, that the defense of our allies is as uh, robust as it can be, why we're taking steps with regard to missile defense in the region, and why we're conducting exercises like we are uh, with the South Koreans now to make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can uh, to address the very real concerns we have about the actions of North Korea, actions like this uh, test would indicate. Uh, Iraq's parliament seems to have voted today to oust the defense minister. Um, they also, as far as I understand, don't have uh, an interior minister. Um, and this is a concern for the U.S., given that this is one of our closest allies in the counter-ISIL fight. Are you worried that there's a positive of leadership there, that there's political instability is already affecting our um, efforts there at all? Uh, I'll leave uh, domestic Iraqi politics to the, to the Iraqi government. Uh, the one thing I will say is that um, we have an excellent working relationship with the Iraqi Ministry of Defense and with the Iraqi military, uh, and certainly that continues on a daily basis right now in the campaign against ISIL, and we have every confidence that that will continue. Yes, Carla. Um, going back to Syria and Drabalus, have you heard from either your Turkish allies or from your Kurdish allies about um, attacks from Turkey on the Kurds or vice versa? Uh, we are in, obviously, close communications with uh, all of our partners on the ground involved in the ISIL fight, uh, including uh, Turkey and, uh, and our partners in, in Syria. And uh, this effort so far has been focused on ISIL. Uh, it, it was a bad day for ISIL yesterday in Jarabalus. It was another bad day for them today. Uh, and that's thanks in part to our, the, the many partners who are in our coalition right now. And, uh, and so we remain focused on ISIL, and we believe all of our partners are as well. So you're not aware of any attacks between the two? Uh, I'm aware that, uh, that our coalition, including the folks you mentioned, remain uh, focused on ISIL, and uh, that's produced progress in the last 24 to 48 hours. And just to follow up on Bob's, you said there was at least one airstrike today, U.S. airstrike. Can that's you tell right. us what was hit? And uh, also, just as a housekeeping, none of the strikes from yesterday were on the CENTCOM strike list today. Is there a reason for that? I don't believe that's... Uh, I'll check that. That's not my understanding. They may not have been referenced Jarabalus specifically. Uh, it may be in the region Manbij is close, for example. So uh, I'll check on that. But I'm, my understanding is that the uh, airstrikes that took place were captured on the, on the normal uh, OIRCJ uh, TF release that you all get. So. Uh, strike today hit. Uh, I, I don't have the exact information, but I understand it was, uh, again, in the vicinity of, of Jarabalus, and it was, again, focused on, on a specific ISIL, ISIL target. Peter, the, Lucas. Peter, the Iranian defense minister said today that this type of harassment by Iranian vessels against the U.S. Navy will continue. Do you have a message to him or his spokesman today? Uh, I'm not aware of those uh, comments, but uh, I guess my response to that would be, uh, we certainly hope it doesn't continue because it serves no uh, purpose other than to raise tensions uh, in an important part of the world and uh, tensions that we don't seek to, to have escalated. We are conducting ourselves again, as we always have, as the Navy does around the world, uh, in a safe and professional manner. And our sailors will continue to do that, and they will continue to take the steps they need to uh, to protect themselves, their ships, and, uh, and our interests in the region. Just shifting topics uh, to Guantanamo Bay, um, can we expect more detainee transfers in the near future? Uh, I don't have any additional transfers to read out from here. Um, but as you know, the secretary uh, continues to take the steps that he feels are uh, necessary to take to responsibly close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. And that includes continuing to try and work with Congress in terms of closing the facility and also, as appropriate, 
uh, continue to review the cases of individuals who have been deemed eligible for transfer through the interagency process. And if there are uh, additional people who meet the interagency process and have been uh, approved for transfer, then of course the secretary will uh, give consideration to, to those individual cases on a case-by-case -case basis. Isn't the Pentagon carrying out any, an unlawful order in closing the base when Congress has stipulated in law that it's you cannot close Guantanamo Bay right now? We are doing what is uh, appropriate, and that is to engage with members of Congress who absolutely have a say in the future of uh, the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, rightly so. Uh, as you know, Lucas, there are members of Congress who feel very strongly about the need to close the facility. There are others who have a, have a different view, and the Secretary, uh, again, remains uh, confident that there's an opportunity here to have a conversation with Congress, an appropriate conversation about the future of that facility and whether or not there could be an opportunity to move those who cannot be transferred to another location, to another country, uh, those who cannot be released because they pose such a threat to housing them uh, at a facility, an appropriate facility here in the United States, and that's a conversation that, again, he hopes uh, to have, with, continue to have with Congress. You cannot move those detainees anywhere in the United States which or is, spend any money to do that. Which is why we're engaged with Congress, uh, absolutely, to try and address the concerns that they have. Finally, does the Secretary support <clears throat> denying justice to the 9-11 families to transfer 9-11 detainees outside of U.S. custody? Um, uh, the Secretary believes in the appropriate handling of uh, all those cases. Uh, any detainee who's at, at Guantanamo now, uh, and there's a legal process that's been followed in each and every one of those cases, and the Secretary supports the legal process in these cases. You cannot rule out the potential that some 9-11 conspirators could be transferred outside of Guantanamo to a third country. Uh, I'm not going to even uh, respond to that question because you're talking about a hypothetical that I'm we, the individual cases at Guantanamo get reviewed uh, as appropriate, and uh, there's uh, that there's nothing uh, along the lines of what you've talked about that uh, that I can comment on this time because I'm not aware of any uh, suggestion that that's happening. Phil, just a quick question, just a, a clarification on, on Manbij. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that some SDF forces would remain there, um, but I understand that the uh, request from Turkey is that they all YPG uh, go to the other side of the Euphrates. So um, is there, uh, is that the U.S. position as well, that there should not be any YPG in Manbij as of next week? Or is the U.S. position that some can stay as part of the SDF? So there again, Phil, there's, um, we have every reason to believe that the SDF will honor the commitments that it, it made. This is an active uh, war zone. This is a complicated situation in which there are still pockets of ISIL resistance, and I think it's appropriate for uh, local forces to be able to conduct the operations necessary to uh, address the ISIL threat that remains. Manbij is not done, uh, as you know, but uh, we have no indication at this point that uh, the SDF um, will do anything other than the commitments that they've made. What are those commitments? But, I'm sorry, so, so will the YPGs remain in Manbij? There are, again, I'm just, Manbij is not complete. There are forces that are uh, still taking out pockets of resistance. There's been a movement uh, as appropriate um, back east of the Euphrates, and we have every reason to believe that uh, that, that will continue. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, Peter. Uh, reported by the United Nations command that North Korea is uh, laying landmines near DMZ to prevent defections. Can you comment on this? About the discovery of those landmines? Yes. Um, I did see the report about that. Obviously, we have uh, concerns about uh, uh, the placement of, of uh, landmines that might pose a threat. Uh, so uh, it's, it's obviously a concern to us. I don't have all the details on that particular incident, but I, I know that it was something that uh, U.S. forces Korea uh, certainly alerted us to here and uh, remains a concern, of course, for General Brooks and his team. Also another one, uh, North Korean, uh, do you know that the North Korean uh, SLBM test, they already had uh, April, last April and then also uh, two days mm -hmm. ago. This is the really uh, uh, seriously concerned about between U.S. and South Korea. Why does the United States did not 
any preparing their SLB test. Do you have any uh, uh, information for before they testing? Any uh, Jay, I'm not, I'm not going to discuss intelligence matters uh, from this podium. Um, you can be sure, and certainly our South Korean uh, colleagues, uh, we remain in close uh, contact with the South Korea, uh, with our allies in the region, about potential threats that are uh, present and the steps that need to be taken to, uh, to protect against those threats, and we'll continue to do so. The future, if it's red again, the, what you're going to do? The, we are uh, so depend on the United States for nuclear umbrella and security protection. So. That's, that's what allies do. They work closely with each other and they uh, coordinate their activities. They engage in uh, military exercises, as we're doing uh, right now with South Korea. We are working, of course, on the development of the of the THAAD system. We are taking additional steps with regard to missile defense in the region. All of these steps are intended to uh, protect our interests and, of course, the interests of our allies in that part of the world. And uh, we'll continue to take the appropriate steps dealing, uh, having to deal with the, the provocations and the actions of North Korea, consistent with what we just saw with this uh, with this latest test. Yes, Corey. Uh, just a clarification on the Iran incidents. Uh, mm -hmm. Which of the U.S. ships fired the warning shots? Um, my understanding is the the Squall fired the warning shots, but I would uh, again urge you, since I have gotten this information shortly before I came out here, to uh, check with CENTCOM and with NAVCENT on the particulars. Yes, Hi, Thomas. Hi. Mr. Um, yeah. this operation kind of seemed to come out of nowhere. There wasn't that much uh, talk in this building, at least of, of that uh, key border town. So I'm kind of curious, uh, how much of a heads up did uh, Turkey give us since it was a joint operation? We loaned ISR and air support mm -hmm. to it. Um, you know, what was that coordination like and how long did we know before it happened that it was going to happen? Uh, I'm not going to give you a, a calendar on it, Thomas, but I can assure you that uh, our conversations with the Turks have been ongoing. Uh, for months, of course. They're a member of the coalition. The issue of the border area has been a, a, a topic of our discussions for some time, and uh, uh, we, this was closely coordinated and, and something that, uh, again, we supported through the coalition and something that we think uh, could make a difference in the fight uh, against ISIL. And now that it's happened, again, the, the goal here was to try and, and solidify and, and, and address what's been a real concern, and that's foreign fighter flows and this particular border crossing, and uh, now there's been a positive step taken. We think that's a good thing. Well, I mean, and obviously they're trying to drive a wedge between the African Kurds and the Kurds uh, advancing out of Manbij. I mean, was that part of your guys' conversation as well? We've uh, been talking with the, the Turks uh, for some time. We understand uh, those concerns. We understand the concerns of uh, many of our partners and players. It's a complicated situation. We've done what we can as a, obviously a key member of the coalition to try and address uh, those concerns and, and make sure that everyone stays focused on the, the same goal and the same common enemy we all share, and that's ISIL. And that's what we think was the end product of uh, this effort uh, over the last 24, 48 hours. And, uh, just going back to Saka, that kind of got uh, drowned out with the Drabalus. Has there been any further air-to-air -air -air incidents between us and the Syrian Air Force or Russian Air Force? I'm not aware of any. Yes. Staying on Gerabolus, um, as you mentioned, it's a complicated situation. Mm -hmm. uh, how difficult is it for U.S. forces to maintain this positive relationship with our allies in the region uh, when there's tension between uh, the Kurds and the Turks? Mm -hmm. But the Turks and uh, the Kurds and the U.S. forces all have one common enemy, ISIL. Well, that, that's what makes it easier. Uh, we all share this enemy. We all believe it's important to make progress as quickly as possible against ISIL and to accelerate the defeat of ISIL because ISIL poses a threat to all of us. Uh, and so that one uh, common factor is significant here and was the reason that uh, uh, everyone was supportive of this action uh, taking place in, in, this, in this way and at this time. And so, uh, again, it's a complicated situation. There are going to be concerns that need to be addressed, and uh, we're doing our part to try and address them and try and keep everyone focused, as I said, on the common enemy that we all share, and that's ISIL.
Do you think having uh, one common enemy is ultimately going to help bring the Kurds and the Turks to the table uh, for future conversations uh, to reduce tension in the region that they may have? I'll leave that to, to the, the Turks and to the, the Kurds to, to speak to, to the future. I, I can only address what we're doing as a coalition uh, focused on ISIL. And again, uh, we share this common enemy. We've made uh, common progress against that enemy in recent days and weeks, and we look forward to continuing that progress uh, in the coming days ahead. Yes. One last question on Gerobolis. Uh The Turkish foreign minister came out with a fairly thinly veiled threat saying that he would, f that Turkish forces would fire if they didn't go back to the other side of Euphrates, uh, the YPG that is. With the U.S. supporting the Turkish assault, couldn't that be seen by the YPGs taking sides in this issue? We, again, we go back to what we've been saying. We, this is a situation where we share a common enemy, ISIL, where we have been working with uh, local partners and coalition members to try and address their concerns as we confront this central enemy. And we uh, remain focused on that effort. And uh, we believe that this can be accomplished successfully uh, while addressing the concerns of the various players. And we'll continue to do that. And again, these are uh, Signif there are significant contributions made from a range of partners and, and coalition members. This is not just a U.S. effort. There have been significant local forces that have made uh, sacrifices in this fight in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, there are coalition members who continue to provide significant uh, accelerants to this campaign, to further this campaign beyond the United States. We're deeply appreciative of those efforts. and. Uh, we want to continue this, this pace. We want to step this up. We want to do this even sooner. You've heard Secretary Carter talk about that. This was, again, a significant step in Drabalus. It will be it was a significant step in Manbij, and we think there are going to be more taken in the days ahead in Iraq as well. Yes? I'm sorry. Just on North Korea, um, with the bilateral decision to deploy THAAD, um, upsetting Russia and China and your peers and obviously North Korea, are we to expect more aggressive, um, you know, by putting THAAD there, Operational 2017. I mean, can you talk about, should we expect a little bit more aggression from North Korea? Well, we're doing, it's a, a defensive system, and so we're taking steps. Uh, we're not going to predict the future. We would welcome uh, steps by North Korea to ease tensions and to not take these kinds of provocative actions. But in the meantime, we have to address the reality we see and, and work with our allies. And that's just one in a, of course, a number of steps that, that uh, we've taken to try and bolster our alliance relationship and the security and defensive posture that we have in the region. And, uh, you know, we would certainly hope that we don't have to expand and take additional steps, uh, but uh, the reality is what it is. And we are taking the steps that allies should take uh, to try and coordinate and, and work closely together to try and address uh, the, the threat that we see right now from North Korea. Carla? Thanks, Peter. Back to Durabilis. You um, had just said that everyone was supportive of this action. Um, does that mean the Kurds were made aware by either U.S. coalition or Turkish forces prior to the offensive in Drabalus? Uh, Carl, I'm not going to get into all the private negotiations and private discussions that have been, that have been going on, but uh, this is a coalition effort with local partners on the ground, in, in which case there's been a significant amount of consultation and discussion to try and make sure that the end result here is ISIL, uh, is degraded, destroyed, removed from Syria. And uh, we believe that, uh, again, the coalition has made progress on that front. Gerabalus is part of that progress, just as Manbij was a significant part of that progress. And now, uh, while we don't have a timeline on it, as I addressed in Bob's question earlier, certainly we want to keep the focus ultimately on Raqqa and being able to reclaim Raqqa as well. But as a coalition partner, they were going to heads up, right? There have been uh, discussions throughout, uh, uh, throughout this campaign at every step of the way with all of our partners on the steps that are being taken and uh, and we'll continue to consult and uh, and work with our partners as appropriate yes okay. um, I want to throw up uh, the North Korea mm -hmm. um, do you see any progress in terms of North Korea SLBM again I, I got this question earlier I'm uh, I'm not going to characterize uh, what they've done in terms of their testing. The fact that they are testing alone is a provocative act um, that does nothing to Im improve stability and security on the Korean Peninsula. It only escalates tensions 
Uh, and uh, what I know is that uh, regardless of how you view the test, it is a violation of uh, UN Security Council resolutions, and uh, we condemn this action. And uh, again, it does nothing to, to enhance uh, any effort to try and ease tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And so we're going to, as I mentioned before, continue to take the steps we need to with our South Korean allies, our uh, Japanese allies, others in the region who share the same concern we have about what North Korea is doing. Lucas, you're back. Thank you. Uh, why does the U.S. military defend the Kurds but not the other Syrian people? Uh, we are fighting right now, as you know, uh, ISIL in Syria. But that does not mean we aren't concerned about what's happening in Syria. This is a civil war that is a humanitarian catastrophe brought on uh, by the Syrian regime, aided and abetted by uh, allies like uh, Russia and Iran. And uh, we have, uh, obviously, significant concern about what's happening in Syria overall. But our fight and the national security threat right now uh, that is most direct to the United States is ISIL. And we'll continue to, to wage this campaign that I, I might add, Lucas, as I've said, we've gained momentum in that, came, uh, that campaign. We uh, uh, continue to take steps like we have in the last 24 to 48 hours to, uh, to deal with what we see is the most direct threat right now to the United States. I can rephrase that, Peter. Why does the U.S. military protect the Kurds against the Assad regime in northeast Syria, but not the rest of the Syrian people against the Assad regime? Uh, Lucas, we are doing, carrying out our campaign with our local partners against ISIL. We have a diplomatic effort, a significant diplomatic effort that is underway even today, even at this hour, being led by my colleagues in the State Department to try and address the situation in Syria, to do everything we can to uh, keep the Syrian people and uh, ease the suffering of the Syrian people. This is a responsibility for the Assad regime and for uh, players like, uh, like Russia that have significant leverage over the Assad regime to get them to ultimately resolve what we believe cannot be resolved militarily, and that's a diplomatic solution to the situation in Syria. Is Russia and Iran, is that what's preventing the United States against taking any kind of military action against the Assad regime? Uh, Lucas, again, this is a situation where we're trying to address the Syrian civil war from a diplomatic uh, standpoint. We are fighting a military campaign against ISIL, uh, and we're going to continue that campaign even at the same time that, uh, again, our State Department colleagues try and resolve, and our other players, other allies uh, in the region try and resolve what's happening in the Syrian civil war. It is a, a, a catastrophe, it's a disaster, a human suffering that we see every single day. We absolutely are, are, are concerned with that and worried about that and want to do what we can. Getting rid of ISIL is one way uh, to try and address what's going on in Syria and the violence we're seeing. And the barbarity of what ISIL is carrying out is the reason we are carrying out this military campaign. Just one point of clarification on Guantanamo. Did you see the secretary can rule out transferring any of the 9-11 conspirators outside of U.S. custody to another country? Uh, Lucas, I'm not going to uh, refer to the, any individual case right here. The Secretary's responsibilities are clear. Uh, he has indicated, again, he has a responsibility to look at individuals who have been deemed eligible for review. Uh, he is the ultimate uh, arbiter of those uh, individual cases that have been vetted by the interagency, and uh, he has, will continue to carry out those responsibilities as required by law. Way really at this point to shut down Guantanamo to transfer all the detainees from the facility. Uh, there's, there. Secretary Carter's made clear there are some detainees who he believes cannot be released. Absolutely, and but he also believes that it can be done safely, uh, and perhaps more economically, uh, to house those detainees in a facility here in the United States. He also thinks that uh, uh, that might uh, again remove a, a propaganda tool. Uh, that's been used by uh, by terror groups around the world, and so he believes that's why this is uh, in the nation's interest. But it can be, he wants it to be done responsibly. He wants to do it collaboratively with Congress, uh, and uh, and so that's that's why he's uh, approached this in the way he has. But he uh, absolutely believes that there are some detainees at Guantanamo who absolutely should not be released, and he has no plans to release them. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, Lori's in the back. Bob, sit back down. Lori has a question. Oh, Lori. Okay, sure. Sorry, thank you. Thanks, folks. Um, 
Peter, I'm wondering if you can give us an update on the U.S. military's role in the Saudi-led campaign in Yemen. There have been reports that uh, some folks were pulled out, and I'm just wondering if you can bring us up to speed on where that stands. Yeah. Um, Lori, I, I can tell you that, uh, as you know, that uh, the campaign that the, uh, the coalition led by Saudi Arabia, uh, we did provide and have provided uh, some uh, technical advice. We provided uh, logistical support. Uh, for that campaign, uh, that uh, some of that continues, um, but it is uh, uh, we have uh, modified some of our support for that campaign. Just as the uh, there was a cessation of hostilities uh, for a period of time, and I think our our efforts. I think Secretary Kerry uh, spoke to this today. He visited in Saudi Arabia, talked about the effort to try and address uh, the conflict in uh, in uh, Yemen specifically, and uh, the steps that should be taken. Uh, that we believe can be taken to try and ease uh, the conflict there. So the United States still provides uh, some uh, military support for the for the campaign, but it has been modified somewhat, uh, in part reflecting uh, the conditions on the ground. So, does the U.S. Our, also have trained train and advised teams on the ground in Yemen? Um, uh, Bob, as you know, there's uh, uh, we have had a small uh, group of uh, individuals in the past there, uh, working in terms of our CT effort in Yemen, and uh, I'm not going to characterize right now uh, our presence in Yemen, but we have had a small group, uh, as you know, a fusion cell uh, in the past, and uh, but to, uh, I'm not going to, uh, I can't at this point uh, uh, definitively tell you exactly what they are for a variety of operational security reasons, so. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.